So, my name is Will Hubbard. I'm here from the University of Baltimore. I really appreciate you coming. It's wonderful to be back at IPSC. I want to talk to you about my current project, Raising the Patent Bar. Um, I've been writing some things recently that are kind of macro level economic concepts and I've been looking for something that was more specific and so I've come upon a topic that's bothered me for a long time and that has to do with the structure of the patent bar itself. I want to break this uh, discussion into three, three kind of subheadings. One is does the structure of the patent bar matter to the innovation economy? Secondly, I want to talk about whether the structure of the patent bar, the patent bar as structured today is effectively supporting the innovation economy. I'm not surprisingly going to answer that no, since my last bullet point is how should we change the structure of the patent bar to better help the innovation economy. So starting with the top, does the structure of the patent bar matter to the innovation economy? It's a hard question to answer, but one way we can kind of get uh, some sense of the stakes is to just look at the amount of money that is spent on getting services from the patent bar every year. Much of the work is the patent bar. Uh, of the patent bar is prosecution. So by the patent bar here, what I mean is the uh, agents and attorneys that are allowed to represent clients in the patent office. How much do they get from prosecution? Estimates vary, but it's something in the ballpark of maybe eight or nine billion dollars a year. Where I'm from, that's enough money to matter. It's worth talking about. Of course, these fees are only expanding. The reason they are expanding is that we have additional growing services in the form of uh, um, inter partes review and, and, and post grant review, covered business method review. We see more litigation being pushed from the uh, uh, courts into the patent office. So, if anything, the amount of money being spent on the patent bar is going to go up. All right, fine. Is the patent bar effectively serving these, uh, these people who need services in the patent bar? Let me start by telling you how we have the structure that we have today. How do we get it? Well, by statute, the Patent Office is given the power to require practitioners to have certain credentials. By regulation, the Patent Office has decided that these practitioners must have scientific or technical backgrounds. And it's this requirement that I'm going to be focusing on today, the requirement for scientific or technical backgrounds. That's not very clear, so the Patent Office provides more detail in something called the General Requirements Bulletin, or the GRB, which those of you who are members of the Patent Bar, you've seen this, and those of you who can't be members of the Patent Bar and wish you were, maybe you've seen it too. We have two categories. We have Category A, Category B. Category A gives us 32 undergraduate degrees that automatically qualify you to sit for the Patent Bar. Uh, you can see these, of course, skew towards the natural sciences and engineering. Category B is your a la carte admission. This is where you can assemble a variety of credits and uh, kind of cobble together something that looks a little bit like maybe what you would have gotten had you done an undergraduate major. For example, down here, option four, 40 semester hours, take eight from chemistry, eight from physics, maybe assembles, a little, little bit of biology, botany, micro, what have you. Good enough, says the patent office. So this is making any sense. We have these very detailed requirements, and I want to explore whether this makes any sense. Well, it turns out that occupational licensing is something that economists have studied uh, in great detail. And uh, the economists recognize that occupational licensing produces costs and benefits. We should expect to see those same costs and benefits in the patent bar. Uh, we just hope that the benefits are more than the costs. So what are the costs? Uh, not surprisingly, the costs of occupational licensing are a dead weight loss. We're going to raise the cost of supplying some service. How much are we going to raise it? We're going to raise it by whatever it takes to get a license. Whatever it takes to get a license, it's going to make the supply of services more expensive. Whenever we increase the cost of supply, we generate a dead weight loss. How much of a loss are we seeing with the patent bar? Again, it's very hard to know, but it looks like there's at least a meaningful increase in the cost of patent services. We have a big market with relatively few practitioners. Turns out, on average, if you are a member of the patent bar, you can expect to bill somewhere between $320,000 $350,000 a year. Pretty lucrative. This produces rich median salaries. Patent agents, 2015 numbers, median salary of 126, patent attorneys even better, 175. Compare this to the median salaries 
for attorneys. Patent agents meeting salaries are higher than those of attorneys. We also know that there's some evidence that the cost of acquiring patents is keeping some people from getting patents. That's what a deadweight loss is, right? Our, our people at the margin, when the price goes up, can no longer afford to buy something they would like to buy. And there's some suggestion that there are people who might want to buy patents, but don't because of the cost. Here's the, uh, um, the report on the 2008 person patent survey among technology startups. The cost of getting a patent is the most common reason cited for not patenting a major technology. So it looks to me like the technological background requirement is increasing the costs meaningfully in some sense. This is not a problem to the economists if the benefits of occupational licensing outweigh these costs, and they may. Economists identify three reasons why occupational licensing sometimes is worth it. One is that occupational licensing can cure informational asymmetries. I'll talk about that in a moment. Two, the uh, occupational licensing can paternalistically protect consumers from themselves. And last, occupational licensing can protect third parties. So how do we cure informational asymmetries? What does this mean? Sometimes in uh, seeking services in a market, the service provider has information about the quality of the services that, that uh, a consumer may want. The consumer doesn't have this information. Consumers who are worried about buying lemons may choose not to participate in the market. Moreover, service providers may not invest as much in improving the quality of their services if they are not confident that consumers will pay a premium for that improvement. So, enter occupational licensing, which identifies criteria related to quality and then demonstrates who has these criteria and who lacks them. As a result, consumers can uh, have better information in the marketplace. This is particularly pronounced when expertise is required to assess the quality of services. Think things like doctors and lawyers. We don't know, I certainly don't know, who would be a good doctor, but I rely on licensing in various guises to tell me something about that. By helping the consumers avoid lemons, the quality of services available in the market, they go up, they improve. Okay? As people who are less qualified are pushed from the market, overall quality increases. As investments are made in supply, and as demand increases, we get uh, benefits that offset the potential deadweight losses. Another uh, justification for occupational licensing is to paternalistically protect consumers, because consumers sometimes make bad decisions even if they have good information. Let's say that you need some electrical work done at home, and you are trying to decide whether to hire a very expensive electrician who is licensed, or your buddy who says he's done this before, and you say, hey, you know what, I'm going to hyperbolically discount the, the possibility of an electrical fire and go with my buddy, or I'm going to uh, suffer from cognitive biases and, and discount risk because of the optimism bias, and, uh, and I'm going to go with my buddy. Uh, these are things that might lead to electrical fires down the road. We might protect you from yourself. So it protects the consumers. This means that some of the concerns about reducing the size of the market are overstated because there are certain people who should never have been in the market in the first place. Now this is again going to be likely when expertise is required to assess services and the result is going to be that occupational licensing improves quality. Last, we have protection of third parties. Let's say, for example, you're trying to decide, you're no longer talking about doing the electrical work in your house, you now have an apartment building and you're trying to decide whether to go with your buddy who's cheap, who says he knows something about electricity, or uh, maybe go with Keith, right, with his electrical engineering degree that he barely remembers, apparently. Uh, or maybe uh, you'll go with someone who's licensed, more expensive, you go do it on the cheap, and the net result is that third parties die in electrical fire. All right, so this is going to improve quality of services under this justification as well. Great, so why do we have the patent bar? We've got some justifications. We can go back and look and find out why we have the patent bar. Why did the patent office do this? Uh, well, it turns out this is easier said than done. Because when you go and start trying to find out why we have the patent bar, things get very murky in the historical record. Uh, it's clear that we've had this requirement, this technical background requirement, since 1908 for agents and since 1922 for attorneys. But we don't have a clear explanation as to why. In fact, when you go and you look at the explanation, it seems not to be a problem of lack of technological sophistication, Rather, the patent bar was established because there were hucksters selling unnecessary legal services. 
So nonetheless, we have regulation that leads to technological, um, uh, this technological requirement. GRB dates back to at least 1963. So remember, the GRB was all these with specific degrees and specific numbers. You know, why is it 24 hours for, for physics and 30 hours for chemistry? Why those particular numbers? Not entirely clear. I've tried to find out more information. I've not yet been successful. Um, I, I've got a FOIA request into the patent office. Maybe they'll give me some, some exciting secret sauce. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But in that absence, I can do a simple application to the patent bar. I can take my economic justifications and try to figure out how would the patent office use those economic justifications to defend the technical background requirement. They would say, look, expertise is required to assess these services. Those who need representation in the patent office cannot assess the technological qualifications of practitioners. And they would say this addresses an informational asymmetry and maybe paternalistically protects some people. Some inventors, they can't assess the technological background, so we're helping protect them from themselves. They would say that this requirement improves the quality of services. Uh, by, and, and that, therefore, is going to boost demand and supply and offset any deadweight loss. They would say that overall, these benefits exceed the costs. This is presumably what they would have to say to defend occupational licensing uh, in the patent bar in terms of this technical, uh, this technical requirement, technical background requirement. But let's look at some actual matter, modern patent day realities to see if this makes any sense. Remember that the, the patent bar is something that we set up in the mid to early 20th century. Does it make sense today? Start with the claim that expertise is required to assess the services of a practitioner in, uh, from the patent bar. Is this really true? Inventors often have technological expertise. That's how they discover inventions. It's one of the tools they use to discover inventions. And so in trying to assess whether your patent agent or attorney has sufficient technological background, it seems that much of the time, those in need of services actually have expertise themselves. Moreover, inventors today are more sophisticated than they've ever been, at least insofar as institutional inventors are more sophisticated than individual inventors. In 1991, 20% of patents issued to individual inventors, 80% going to institutional inventors. Today, 6% of patents are issuing to independent inventors. So the vast majority of parties needing representation in the patent office today are sophisticated. Let's take the claim that the technological background requirement improves quality of service. Is this true? I think it's true some of the time. I think this is very much the case some of the time. But there's a disconnect between patent eligible subject matter and the technological backgrounds recognized by the patent office. Easy examples are business methods and design patents. An MBA is not a recognized background that qualifies someone to sit for the patent bar, yet business methods are frequently patented. Design patents cover non-functional elements, and yet you need to have an engineering degree to prosecute these patents? Doesn't make sense. Moreover, practitioners are very entrepreneurial in the sense that they do not limit themselves to representing inventors in the area of technology that qualified that practitioner to sit for the patent bar. It is not uncommon, for example, to have some electrical engineering uh, a graduate work on a mechanical engineering invention. So the net result is, I think that yes, does the quality improve because of the technological background? Um, maybe some, but not an enormous amount. <coughs> and then there's the claim that the benefits exceed the cost. The benefits that I think are less, uh, uh, less, less, perhaps are smaller than the patent office would like them to be. Do they exceed the costs? Well, since the establishment of the technological background requirement, much has changed. <laughs> One is that the patent bar has failed to grow at the same pace as the demand for services. If you look since 2000, the graduates in engineering and natural sciences have been roughly flat, whereas the patent applications have increased, oh, it's 70%? That actually might be, might be a, a, a lower statement, it might be more as much as 100%. Since, since 2000, patent applications have grown enormously, but the patent bar has not. There's also a growing need for legal expertise at the patent office. So since the mid 20th century, we have the rise of the federal circuit, so that much of patent law is now driven by a legal institution. 
Particular examples, look at the changes in Section 101 jurisprudence. Look at what has happened to your obviousness analysis after KSR. Look at uh, uh, patent office litigation. So with patent office litigation, in order to be lead counsel, you have to be a member of the patent bar. Even though patent office litigation was designed to take litigation from the courts, in large, one of the major design features, take litigation from the courts and push it into the patent office. Now what this means is that many inventors and others who need legal services in the patent office, uh, as a practical matter, they need to hire somebody who has both a technical background and legal training. Let's remind you again the differences in the costs here. Patent agents, 126. Patent lawyers, 175. As a practical matter, more and more people actually are being forced to hire the patent lawyer. Many inventors and others may prefer somebody with less technical expertise and more legal expertise. We have to remember that one of the skills we want to develop as a lawyer, one of the skills we want to teach our students to develop, is the ability to learn complicated facts quickly and to be able to understand the law that relates to them. Okay, so how should the patent bar be changed? What is my, what is my proposal? My proposal is that a JD should qualify you to take the patent bar. Because of the increased importance of legal expertise in patent matters, having a JD should qualify you to take the patent bar exam. You still have to take the exam. Moreover, there will be a certification for those who satisfy the technical background requirement. So Keith's got an electrical engineering degree. Keith can still have, he says, yes, patent bar member, technological certification. So we still have the the uh, uh, tool to cure any informational asymmetries about technological credentials because we still have technological specialists out there as a shorthand for whether or not you satisfy that, that requirement. What's the effect of this change? Well, the obvious effect of change is that the size of the patent bar should increase, particularly since the, the median lawyer compared to the median patent attorney uh, suggests that that disconnect with, with patent attorneys making a lot more money than lawyers uh, that suggests that there will be an influx of lawyers um, in, in, some, in some sense. Patent bar membership, though, will still provide the traditional benefits of occupational licensing. That's because we have all patent bar members would have technical training, legal training, or both. Please come out of order. Technological certification will preserve the existing benefits of occupational licensing, this is this thing where Keith gets to say he's a technological specialist on top of being a patent attorney. Quality of service is maintained because legal expertise is, uh, is guaranteed by these people who lack technological expertise. A few final thoughts, I'll make this very clear because I don't want you to um, um, uh, misunderstand what I'm trying to say. I think technological backgrounds can absolutely be useful. This is not a claim that these technological backgrounds are not important. I think they're absolutely useful. I think, though, sometimes they're not required. Sometimes an inventor would say, I will teach you what you need to know about a fairly simple invention. I don't need you to have technological expertise. I need you to do the part that I can't do, and that is the law. I think the market can work it out. So it's not to say the technological backgrounds aren't important. This is to say, I think the market can work out when they are important. I think at the high end, so I think that the place I would get pushback on a proposal like this is from uh, uh, regular repeat players at the patent office saying, you're going to give me a low-end practitioner. No, you will still see at the high end, people will hire somebody with a JD and a PhD. The high end won't be affected. Where we're going to see uh, an increase is at the low end where there's a dead weight loss. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Mr. Rob? Sure, a few things. I think this is a really interesting project, but I'd like to see... Uh, and maybe you've done this already as a paper. But one thing, you're saying that there isn't any expertise necessary to evaluate, or isn't as much expertise, because uh, the consumers of this set of services are themselves technologically expert as inventors. But, if, I mean, if you're somebody who speaks English alone, and what you need to judge is whether your French translator is translating accurately in French, you still need to have some way to access that. It's not simply technological expertise, nor even simply legal expertise, but the ability to translate one into the other. And I think if you look at some of the principal agent literature on how uh, signaling works in those markets, 
you might get a better handle on what it is that the, the inventor consumer is actually trying to do. Uh, a few of your trend lines, I mean, you're probably right in the ultimate conclusion, but the fact that a smaller share of patents is being issued to independent inventors doesn't tell you anything unless the share of independent inventors who applied for them aren't being selected out of getting patents simply because they have access to port of search So you need to show that. And then the same thing with the STEM grads. Um, you know, the patent bar is itself growing, but it's happening because of a reallocation within an otherwise black population of science and tech people. And that's interesting and not necessarily. <coughs> Uh, yeah, Dave. Uh, just to follow up on that. So it might be interesting to think about whether uh, to get to the skills that are important, because it seems like you want to protect the low information consumers, right? The the, the big firms are going to sort out who are good patent agents regardless. So uh, do you need to make changes to the patent bar exam or have some much more minimal kind of uh, basic license requirements so that people know how to search prior art in the various fields uh, and maybe draft... Uh, Draft, you know, a little more strict clean drafting or something. And also, I'm wondering, what about various, you know, something like board certification? So not only the, you know, the, the one thing, you, but maybe like, you know, for, again, for the lower information kind of consumer, you know, this person is certified in chemical, and this person in electrical engineering. That's <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, uh, I'm just about out of time. If, if you guys want to talk to me at the break, I'd love to hear uh, more thoughts. Thank you very much.